my name is Earl Diaz. Uh, I am the outreach coordinator here at the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County. Um, and today I'll be hosting another episode of Conversations on Conflict uh, with our special guest, Dr. Deitra Mallory. If you could get, get us started and of course, uh, give us a little bit about your background and tell us about your line of work. Sure. I'll start with whenever like I hear, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. It makes me think that, okay, this is an identity question. So I want to make sure that in this world where we, where we talk about identity a lot, um, that I include some of not just my professional self, but a little bit about me, the individual. I am, I identify um, as a heterosexual Black woman um, that loves food, fashion, and I'm very, very serious about my faith. Um, I also love a good book uh, that's either going to teach me something new, uh, it's going to refresh my memory about something that I have already learned or something I already know, but have been maybe out of touch with it for a while, or something that is purely entertaining. I'm also a huge fan of uh, TV show creator, producer Shonda Rhimes. I love her shows, and uh, I, I'm not a huge TV watcher, but uh, since I've had a recent surgery and uh, a lot of that time has been spent binge watching shows because I was just not in a position to do anything else, I have really gotten into the Shonda Rhimes uh, of it all. So uh, she's amazing. Uh, I've been married for 27 years. I have a young adult uh, Gen Z daughter <laughs> and I have four Gen Z and millennial nieces and nephews that I that I also uh, love very much. So that's a little bit about uh, the personal me. Uh, professionally, I am a professional psychologist. I hold a PhD in clinical psychology, and I'm also a licensed independent clinical social worker. My master's degree was in social work, and my undergraduate degree was in general uh, psychology. And that pathway, since we're talking a little bit about careers, uh, was because at the bachelor's level, you can do very little with a bachelor's degree in psychology. People don't tell you that. If you want to be a psychologist, whether a professional, you know, psychologist that is, you know, doing research or teaching or something like that, or if you're taking a clinical path where you're going to provide direct services, you actually have to have a PhD. And so at the master's level, however, in social work, you can do what a lot of people want to do, which is I want to be a therapist. And so at the master's level in social work, you can practice after you've done quite a bit of training and quite a bit of gotten a lot of experience, you can take a license and exam and you can actually practice uh, with a master's degree in social work. And so that's why my path kind of went psychology, social work, and then back to psychology. Right. Yeah. So TikTok University, <laughs> which you know a lot about, uh, and Instagram indicate that things are a bit different now in terms of career course. People are doing many things, trying many things, and in some ways less wedded to one single path in terms of their career. But I actually think there's a lot of freedom in that. I've also seen it leave younger people challenged about where their focus should be. So it just depends on the person. But traditionally, there's a developmental course to a career where you're kind of progressing over time, right? Right. And sometimes that things that means doing one thing at a time for a period of time and seasons when you may be doing multiple things. So for me, it has been both a combination of timing and opportunity. Uh, and right now I'm in sort of a second wave of being in that multiple things category. <laughs> And this time I'm driven by both finishing some things that I've started in my professional life and then also kind of birthing some new dreams, some new things that uh, have come up for me that I've really, really taken uh, a strong interest in as a result of my work. In terms of work, there's been a theme to my experience that was kind of unplanned. So I am the product of a father who was a social worker 
and a mother who was and still is an educator. And so somehow I found myself fortunately, uh, as it turns out, caught between those two worlds. Um, and that kind of allowed me to witness and understand the impact of the home, the school and the community um, as levers that can be used to help children and adolescents grow and develop in healthy ways. And then alternatively, uh, when any one of those systems is not operating at its best, it can similarly you know, impact young people negatively and be a source of pain instead of it being a protective buffer. So as I mentioned, I'm finishing some things up and birthing some new things. So I've worked in urban education for just about all of my professional career. I'm uh, caught between that, you know, dad who was a social worker, mom who's an educator. Right. Uh, so I ended up being uh, uh, in urban education for over 25 years now. And I've had the opportunity to view the ed sector from the lens of the classroom, um, as a teacher, as a service provider, and then at different levels of leadership. And over a decade ago, I advocated for and established uh, and formalized uh, the school mental health programming for students in the district that I work in. And that um, system is inclusive of screening for mental health challenges, uh, providing mental health goal standard treatments, and paying attention to treatment outcomes. So like not just applying a treatment, but you know, how is that treatment working for that child? Is it making a difference for them in terms of how they were feeling, primarily in terms of symptoms, right? right. And how they were behaving. So okay. mental health is one of my largest work streams and within my portfolio at work and the area that you know, more and more is kind of touching everything. So bringing that work full circle for me means bridging the gap between physical health and mental health. Uh, and we know from the COVID pandemic that taught us that those two things kind of, you know, go hand in hand. Right. Uh, we also have to be more proficient in early identification and support to special populations. So an example might be like if a student lost a parent, how do we make sure that the right people know about that at the school level so that we can layer supports and become that protective buffer um, that that child may need at school? And then how do we help the home, the school, and the community, you know, become the one, two, three power trifecta for that student? Other special populations might mean students that are experiencing unstable housing, um, students that are in foster care, students returning from locked facilities. So there are a couple of different categories of special populations that I believe, you know, as we finish this work and we have such a strong, robust uh, model in D.C. for mental health, easily replicable in other uh, districts. I'm extremely proud to have led that work from its inception, but I think that's sort of the, the next level of the work. Right. And then we talk about birthing new things. Um, so on a personal, professional level, I've maintained a private practice for many years, and many of my clients are families, parents that are navigating adolescence with their kids, uh, couples that are struggling in their relationship, and uh, a lot of professional women who have decided to seek support because the weight of being uh, a woman uh, especially a Black woman uh, in these times, uh, is a pretty heavy boulder to carry uphill. Uh, and so I founded uh, Cycle on Wellness to address that gap, that specific need, creating and expanding an integrated uh, wellness safe space mm -hmm. for Black women that have been kind of left out I think not just Black women, I think lots of minority populations have been left out of the wellness conversation. Um, but in terms of my client base, um, many Black women have been left out of the wellness literature and the service continuum. So creating a, a need that I saw for myself first, right, and then with my clients. And we also work with organizations that are seeking to improve 
work satisfaction, decrease burnout with their employees, and increase retention um, by attending to the needs of the whole person, which encompasses all of those demands around wellness, all of the things that we need to feel whole. So when we talk about birthing new things and setting new goals, that's kind of that's kind of where I am there. Obviously, like all of that sounds wonderful. As far as like a lot of the work that you have done, obviously, and a lot of these different things that you personally ventured into and obviously like created, how is most of your work or some of your work tied into how you feel like it ties in with the youth or students? So having worked in uh, a school district for a long time, um, I have had the privilege of working with students across the developmental spectrum, everything from preschoolers that are, you know, two and three years old. Uh, to our overage students who are, you know, older than the traditional graduation age, but still committed to trying to finish their high school um, experience at an alternative program. So mm -hmm. I have um, assessed preschoolers uh, suspected of having disabilities, which required the skill to apply uh, assessment tools and developmental theory in natural environments like the home or daycare programs, looking for signs like parent and child interaction and how do they play with other children. Um, but the hardest part of that work, um, I believe was helping parents, uh, giving them the emotional support that they needed um, when hearing that their child was not a typically developing child. Uh, and giving them the tools and the self-efficacy or that, like, you've got this school, these, uh, you've got this skills um, to help their child at home and how to talk about, you know, a child that has a disability with others, maybe in the family or in the neighborhood or friends without having so much shame about it. And then I think, I guess I'll approach this from a, from a developmental uh, standpoint. Uh, and then I've also worked with school age kids, like kids that are in grades um, kindergarten through fifth grade, where I've provided counseling services that touched on the things that are most important at that age period, like gaining a sense of mastery, being good at something, making and keeping friends, building a healthy sense of self. And again, being that special set of eyes that could share with a parent or a teacher you know, I'm noticing something um, that might improve uh, healthy adjustment and optimal academic achievement at school for that child. So mm -hmm. as adults, um, we sometimes have a tendency to want to um, label the child as having the problem or changing the child instead of changing the environment or changing some of our engagement with the child, I've always tried to develop relationships, whether I was serving as a, a peer or a service provider or a leader, always tried to develop good enough relationships with the people in a building um, or centrally to be able to say, you know, hey, um, you know, let's look at, let's look in the mirror for a bit. Let's see what we can do to improve outcomes for the child instead of finding ways to change the child. And then uh, and then lastly, I, I would say at the secondary level, which may be my favorite group of kids to work with, I'm not sure, <laughs> um, might be a little biased there. My work has really been grounded in the fact that by middle and high school, you know, for many young people, life has started life in for them. Like they've been disappointed by people that were supposed to care and have their back. Um, peer issues start coming up for them. School becomes more challenging. And depending on what your social context is, like you might be starting to not be so hopeful about the future by that time. Um, and that's showing up on, you know, in many ways, maybe it's showing up on in um, how hard you work at school. You know, if you stop caring, then you're not trying so hard anymore. Right. How much empathy you show towards other people. Like if you're not feeling so hopeful about your life, why should I care about, you know, what's happening in other, in other people's lives? 
or you're starting to feel the tremendous pressure of preparing for college or post high school. You know, what do I need to do next? You no, know, regardless of what your situation is, like it's just a very pressure filled, um, life is lifing <laughs> kind of period for adolescents. And so the work to me and what has been my kind of frame of reference in working with students has been, you know, healing from trauma experiences first and then tapping into the identification of what their strengths and gifts are. Like, what's easy for you? What are you good at? Mm -hmm. How do you maximize that to get what you want out of life? Learning how to be resourceful. How do you find information out that you need to solve problems? How do you advocate for yourself? And then finally, I would say reestablishing hope for the future. Because when we get to middle and high school, if there's no hope for the future, you know, we've got to first get adolescents to care first about themselves, then about others. Right. So I, I would say those are the three when we think about, you know, the range um, of students that I've worked with, that that's what the work has looked like. Right. I think obviously, like, especially with uh, with the mission that we have here at the Conflict Resolution Center and obviously us working with like uh, MCPS and uh, having mediators at schools and with a lot of uh, the demographic that you've mentioned, especially uh, working with like often middle schoolers, sometimes high schoolers um, and a lot of young kids definitely has been a lot of honestly like what you mentioned, like seeing them in a moment of like when life starts lifing and when a lot of these uh more so obviously with what we do being peer related issues and also sometimes how issues from what could be from home or outside of school uh, could really like start diving into their personal lives and their personal characters and their developmental stages. And obviously uh, a crucial part of what we try to do, regardless of us being a neutral resource for them, we still uh, are a way for them to start learning about how to be resourceful, as you mentioned as well, for them to try to, you know, resolve problems and obviously like be able to develop the ability to create solutions, especially mm -hmm. during such a time in their life where like their social life is generally like a major portion of uh, of who they are. Oh, yeah. It's the most important, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely at yeah. that time, it feels yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah, nothing else matters. Right. So moving on. So as a professional psychologist and licensed social worker, how has that guided your line of work with students and how do you feel like all of your experiences have kind of like tied or interconnected or even indirectly connected with topics such as like conflict resolution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think there's so many interdependencies, like with everything I just mentioned, there is the risk of being offended being hurt, being angry with someone, right? That can right. lead to conflict. And that's how kids would typically uh, end up, you know, getting connected to me as a service provider. Or if I if I'm a was a classroom teacher, you know, it's the the thing that led to uh, a parent conference, perhaps, right? It's the thing it it's it's ever present. But conflict resolution to me is first observed and then learned at home and then in the broader community. I think we would all agree that like when there are differences at home, how people respond to those becomes like your frame of reference. So right. if everybody kind of yells and screams, if they fight physically, do they say things that kind of hit below the belt and are very hurtful, uh, the same applies to the community. Like if people resolve conflict by you know, fighting, yelling, screaming, all of those things, then that's what we learn. So whenever I've had to engage in conflict resolution or restorative work with young people, if we're not in the middle of the crisis, this looks different if you're in the middle of a crisis. Right. <laughs> um, but if we're not in the middle of a crisis, I ask them to think about that. Like, let's think about like, when people have conflicts in your home, in your community, what does that look like? And asking that question will often, and I will even ask parents that same question, you know, to think back on those learned behaviors because our family of origin 
um, plays such a key role in how we develop our own response patterns. And whether or not they're right or wrong, they're patterns that are difficult to unstick right. once you learn them. Definitely. So, you know, even in talking to families about their family of origin and how they learn to resolve conflict, not from a place of pointing fingers and blame to parents or to young people, but to identify where we all have room to grow and to provide alternative ways of responding to what really is underneath conflict. It's usually hurt, it's usually embarrassment, it's usually shame or some other feeling that's typically tied to uh, to offense. And that's what leads to conflict. So like what's underneath the behavior? What's being said that's not being said, you know? Right. Um, how can you listen to the heart of the person uh, when you are, you know, starting to go from, from one to five and from five to 10, you know? Right. Um, so for anybody that I think uh, who does child serving work in any capacity, you know, these kinds of beneath the surface conversations can't be had where there's no relationship. Like you can't ask a parent, you know, so how do y'all solve conflict at home? How do you and your partner solve conflict? You might get an answer you don't want to hear if you don't have that relationship. So we've got to first work on like rapport building and um, mutual respect. And, you know, then I can share some observations that might be tough to hear, whether it's a parent or a child, right. but they know it's coming from a place of care. And they can even disagree with me. And I can receive that from a place of care and say, okay, mom, or okay, dad, or okay, child, you disagree with me on that. Can you help me think through another way that we can solve X, Y, Z? Right. You know? so, so as a clinician, my first job is relationship building. And then my next job is to determine like what developmental, social, emotional, intellectual need is at the root of this that's not being met. What's what what what's what's going unmet? And then I can build my response based on that. So it's a quick, in the moment, you know, fast on your feet kind of response, but it's the same kind of stop, think, act that we ask young people to do all the time. Right. So we have to do it too. I think the work to address conflict is aligned to the mastery of children and adolescents that they have in some of those skills we dis we discussed earlier. It's also to observe behaviors that they've seen in their environments. And then it's unlearning and replacing what the child is seeing is not working well for them. Right. So when we talk about those patterns, you know, sometimes people will, will die married to the same pattern that has not served them well for years and years and years, but they're unwilling to change it. So it's important that when we try to help young people to unlearn behaviors, that they identify, oh, yeah, this is a behavior that's, that's messing me up. This right. is a behavior that's getting me into trouble. This is a behavior that's costing me something, then they're willing to work on it. Right. And for adults, I think it's the time that they need to take to do their own uh, introspection, looking on the inside, holding that mirror up to themselves to address any internal biases they may have, um, you know, and then planning their responses with young people in ways that are both effective and long lasting because you can resolve a conflict and the two kids go off, you know, and they're separate, go off their separate ways. But as soon as the clock strikes three o'clock, <laughs> um, you know, they're back at it. Right. So sometimes that conflict work means working beyond the incident that led to the, to, you know, your work with them. And it has to be something that's ongoing for a period so that the intervention is long lasting and effective. Right. I hope that answers your question. Does that no. get it? That? It okay. definitely does. Uh, it definitely gives me um, a kind of like a, 
an insight to how the connection of like how what your line of work how you can go so in depth obviously in comparison to some of the things that we do obviously as a a different method of conflict resolution for us obviously like having to remain neutral but also with our mediators having their best shot at trying to you know understand and really listen to what might be going on whether that's between adults or parents or the youth mm -hmm. uh, and what really like how you mentioned earlier really listening to what is like what's deeper rooted to what might be you know developing these uh, ongoing conflicts in a variety of topics and yeah. so just a, a just a very insightful way of like how your area of line of work kind of connects to ours um mm -hmm. but also just you having that like ability to deeper connect and really like dive in and go to like levels beyond as to how you can learn more and more to actually really 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 get that uh yeah. those behaviors changed in order to really like you said kind of have like a long-term effect on being able to actually like resolve conflict and just kind of like unlearn what m may have been learned whether at home or just outside of wherever they've been like brought up mm -hmm. yeah um, I think the one thing that you know mediators um should always have an ear for is what's not being said right right I agree if you can get really, really good at that and help the other person to also hear what's not being said, the offense level immediately goes down. Right. Definitely. Yeah. You're teaching perspective taking and empathy and, you know, all the things we, we, we've been talking about. For sure. Of course, I would agree. With your line of experience, I think you are probably one of the people who would give one of the best pieces of advice when it comes to the youth and even adults, of course, regarding conflict. So what be, what would be the best piece of advice you could give to the youth or adults regarding conflict, navigating and dealing with it in general? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we've talked about adults a lot, so let's go straight to the young people. Okay. Um, I think there are three things that they can do to before you even get to conflict, right? You have to be offended. Right. You have to get offended first in order for there to be a conflict. So I would like for young people to first think about how can they manage being offended? So how can I reduce the likelihood that I will get offended by stuff, right? Right. And I think the first thing is to don't take things too seriously. Um, you know, you've heard people say if it won't matter in the next few days or it won't matter in the next five years, you know, things like that on social media. But I think if it won't matter in the next few days, learn to let it go. You will be mad all day, every day if you don't learn how to let things go quickly. Right. Especially if it's not important. So that would be the first piece of advice I'd give to a young person. The second um, piece of advice I'd give is that when, when you do run into a situation, because you will, it would be unrealistic to think that you're never going to have a conflict with someone. You will. Um, when you run into a situation that requires that you need to address something, talk to the person one-on-one. -on -one. No group confrontations. <laughs> Because everybody's ego is involved, right? Right. So, you know, and in addition to talking to the person one on one, you know, say how whatever they did made you feel. Because when you say what it made you feel like, it really disarms the person. If they have any um, empathy in their hearts and you tell them, you know, it hurt my feelings when you said, something about, you know, my shoes, or it really hurt my feelings, or it made me embarrassed when you said such and such about my relationship in front of such and such. Like, tell the person how it made you feel. Right. And ask them if that's what they intended. Because like, you know, well, did you did you mean to embarrass me when you said da 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 da, -da in front of whoever, did you mean to embarrass me? Did you mean to hurt my feelings? Most of the time, it was a misunderstanding and they weren't intending to hurt you, but you got hurt and then you got offended 
and then you got angry and then we had a conflict. So no group confrontations, meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, say how whatever it was made you feel. So that, that would be my second piece of advice to any young person. And then my last piece of advice would be to always look for ways to compromise. No one wants to lose. Right. No one wants to lose. So we have to find a way for both of us to feel like we got something that we wanted. You didn't get everything you wanted. I didn't get everything I wanted, but we both got something. So how do we look for win-win um, outcomes? You, how do we look for win-win outcomes, excuse me, um, when we're trying to navigate a, a conflict or disagreement or something where someone got offended? Right. Um, chances are like talking that through with somebody, you know, that requires some conversation for us to both look for a win-win in a situation. Definitely. And chances are having that conversation is going to result in what might be a new unexpected acquaintance, right? Sure. So those would be my three things. Don't take things too seriously. Um, talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Say how their behavior made you feel. Um, ask if that's what they intended. And then third, look for ways to compromise so that there's a win-win for both people. Sure. I definitely would agree with all three of those pieces of advice. I think they're great pieces of advice. Um, particularly, I would, I mean, all of them, I think are equally as great. Um, but just for the, the sake of obviously like, talking about like the one-on-one -on -one confrontations you obviously you don't want too many opinions you don't want too many egos going on at the same time revolving a conflict that may most likely probably doesn't include any of the other parties that you may have around. <laughs> right right um, and then I mean of course communication is just key when it comes to conflict um and going back to what you mentioned as far as like really speaking of like what the subject was that really offended you and what really hurt you between you and the other person is obviously very important in order to get anywhere Mm -hmm. um and so yeah i believe that all, all three of those things are just like wonderful piece of advice uh the last and one you mentioned also very important and you can take those into any relationship any place you go for definitely definitely i also think the first one is also extremely important uh because like you mentioned like there's definitely got to be a certain level of like individuality that you have to uh, develop in order to, for you to understand like you know that not everything you should allow to really get you to that point where you develop conflict over every little thing I think that's yeah. very important um, because like you mentioned you, you will spend every day angry if you don't develop yes. like, kind of like that uh, in a way like sense of I guess maturity to really yeah. not allow everything to be the end all yeah brush your shoulders off mm-hmm you know, feel yeah. like Teflon, you know, you have that pan or well, they say these are not good to use anymore, but you used to, you know, put your eggs or whatever on Teflon and slide right off. Mm -hmm. That's what you, we, if you get offended easily, you are not operating with your Teflon spirit. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, today, of course, I want to thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Conversation on Conflicts. Um, everything that you spoke about was wonderful. Um, your line of work is amazing and obviously like very, very helpful to, I'm sure, many, many, many people around. And yeah, so I'm just very, very grateful. Good. And thank you for you joining us today.